killed inappropriately, but made no defense. But if I say less than one in a thousand, am I being generous? I think so. I think so. Okay, let's take another one while we're in 53 here, Isaiah 53. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So the question is, how many people died among the wicked and yet were buried with the rich that were not attorneys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just... I've learned over the years of speaking that you can unite any audience by picking on the attorneys a little bit. But I didn't mean to be irreverent here. How many people died among the wicked? You, you recognize the intrinsic contradiction within that verse. Well, if I say less than one in a thousand, am I being generous? Surely. Okay, let's take one more. Number eight, the last of the bunch. We'll take one from Psalm 22. Uh, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, and they pierced my hands and my feet. This is remarkable, by the way, because the official form of capital punishment in Israel was stoning. This was written 700 years before crucifixion was invented. It was invented by the Persians and then widely adopted by the Romans. So, how many prisoners, taken at random, have died by having their hands and feet pierced. Obviously a lot of people, millions were crucified by the Romans. But if I said one, less than one in 10,000, am I being generous? I think so. Okay, so what I've done here, we've concatenated a list of prophecies. Born in Bethlehem, king on a donkey, 30 pieces of silver, temple potter and all that business. Uh, wounds in the hands, no, no defense though innocent. Died with the wicked, the grave with the rich, and uh, crucified. Now the question is, okay, if those are the probabilities of each one of these individually, what's the probability of a particular person having fulfilled all eight of them? Well, that's a, that's a dilemma, because now we're dealing with composite probabilities. And for the purpose of this discussion, we'll assume that these things are randomly distributed. Let's talk about, let me give you a little tutorial on composite probabilities. Let's imagine in this audience that we have 60% of you are men and 40% are women. And suppose we blindfolded someone and had him pick one of you at random in some, under some conditions that would make it equally likely to be any of you. Uh, what would be the chance, if he reached out and touched one of you, that it was a female? Well, how would you analyze? Well, if 60% are male and 40% female, he's got a probability of 40% or probability of 0.4 that he encountered a female. Are you with me so far? Okay. Let me give you a different example. Let's assume that half, uh, that 60% of you are right-handed. And 40% are left-handed. Let's assume for this discussion that those are randomly distributed, independent of sex. They're just, uh, we got right and left-handed people in, that, in a 60-40 ratio. What's the probability that someone selected randomly would be left-handed? Again, it would be 40%. You're with me so far. Here's the point I'm trying to make. What's the probability, assuming these attributes were randomly distributed, of somebody getting a left-handed female? Well, what you do is you take the one distribution, and you take the other distribution, and you would combine those two distributions, you right? And the ones that met both conditions would be the product of those prob two probabilities. In other words, 0.4 times 0 0.4, 0 0.16. In other words, if 40% if of you are female and 40% are left-handed, the combination would be, there 16% of you would be a, a good estimate of, of, of the probability of being a left-handed female. Are you with me? In other words, what I'm trying to get across, a simple way of getting an estimate here is simply take the product of the, liabil the, pro the, the uh, probabilities. Okay, having said all that, probably a 0.16, let's take a look at these eight prophecies. I've made them in powers of 10, so multiplying them just becomes a question of adding up the zeros. So you tend to, a thousand is 10 to the third, and, and, and uh, a hundred is 10 to the second, so a hundred thousand is 10 to the fifth. Two plus three, you with me? So all I need to do is add up the zeros. The probability of one person fitting all these things would be one chance in 10 to the 28th, but I need to work out uh, the, the total people that live. So I take the 100 billion, I'm going to assume 100 billion population as a, as a guess. 
So if I, if I take the combined probability is 10 to the 28th divided by 10 to the 11th, I now have a, still a very large number, a number by 10 to the 17th. Now, if we were in a statistics class in graduate school or whatever, and I was going to try to get across to you what I mean by one chance in 100, what do I mean by that? Well, the way I demonstrate that is I might get a bucket. I would put in that bucket 100 silver dollars. I'd take one of them and mark it with some lipstick or nail polish or something, and I'd mix them all up. And the chance of my reaching in there and picking one at random is one chance in a hundred of getting the one I marked. You with me? That's a way of demonstrating what I mean by that stochastic, that's a, a stochastic statement. Most people are not familiar with dealing with that. So that's, that's okay. So what I want now, what I, need, what I need to do to demonstrate this probability that we're talking about here is I need a bucket that will hold 10 to the 17th silver dollars. That turns out to be a pretty big bucket. That's a lot of silver dollars. In fact, if I want a bucket of 10 to the 17th silver dollars, I need to take the state of Texas, the state of Texas, and fill it with silver dollars, and it'll end up being about two feet deep. That's 10 to the 17th silver dollars. And um, so uh, what I would do then is pick one of you, blindfold you, and put you into a situation where you have an equal likelihood of being exposed to any particular... I, I mix them up in such a way and route you in such a way that you have an equal chance of getting any one of those silver dollars. When you, You're going to reach down there with your blindfold and pick one. The chance that you got the one we marked is one chance in 10 to the 17th. Does that get it across? So you're with me so far. You recognize that? You, it's a way of demonstrating just how unlikely that is. But we're not through. I said we had 300 silver, uh, prophecies to deal with. We took eight of them. Let's assume I take another eight, so I have 16 altogether. To spare you the time, we're not going to actually pick up another eight, but if we did, the eight that I would add would be more technical, more precise, less likely. I'm going to assume, for this simple analysis, that the next eight are no less likely than the ones I've already picked. That's a very generous assumption, obviously. So I've got 300 to choose from. The next eight would be more specific, that is less likely than the previous ones. But I'm going to assume no decrease in likelihoods. I'm just going to add eight of an equivalent kind. So now I have 10 to the 28th times 10 to the 28th. We add the exponents, so that's one chance in 10 to the 56th. But again, I subtract out my 10 to the 11th population over that time. So I now I have a 10 to the 45th, okay? So now... I, want, I need a bucket of silver dollars that will hold 10 to the 45th silver dollars. That's a lot of silver dollars. Let me give you a feeling for how many that is. How big a bucket do I need? I need to make a ball of silver dollars that is 30 times the radius of the earth to the sun. Can you imagine? You can't imagine that many. And uh, 30 times. 30 times the distance of the earth to the sun. A ball of silver dollars. Now, in this case, we'll get our volunteer that's going to pick, we, and we've marked one of these, and mix them all up. I get one of you blindfolded and in a spacesuit, and send them out there under conditions that would make it equally likely to be exposed to any of them. And you reach in, and if you pick the one that we marked, that's one chance in 10 to the 45th. So, I'm going to do this one more time, because I, I say this is getting a little ridiculous, Chuck. This time, I'm, instead of doubling, I'll just triple. I'll go from, from 16, I'll go to 48. Bear in mind, I've got 300 to choose from, but I'm going to reach a little further. And I'm going to, again, assume there's no decrease in likelihoods. Actually, I can find prophecies there that are so rare they stand on their own in terms of this kind of analysis. But let's just assume that the, next, the, uh, the, 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 the rest of them, to make up 48, have, are no less likely than the first eight we picked. Well, that's 10 to the 28th multiplied by itself six times, or 10 to the 168. And now I have to subtract my 10 to the 11th out of there, so that's um, 10 to the 157th. That's a pretty big number. <laughs> How big is it? Well, the first problem I've got is silver dollars won't work. They're way too big. I need something small. I don't need the smallest thing you can imagine. What is the smallest thing you can imagine? An atom. Huh? How's that? It may surprise you to learn that there are estimates of the number of atoms in our galaxy. 
Uh, I want to make a ball of every atom in our galaxy. It turns out there's a commonly accepted estimate among scientists about 10 to the 66th atoms in our galaxy. Well, that, that means if I make a ball of every atom, if I'm going to consider them as, as my sample, um, that's, I'm way short of what I need. I need 10 to the 157th. Okay, so I'll make such a ball for each atom in the universe. So now I've got 10 to the 66th times 10 to the 66th. Well, that's 10 to the 132nd. I'm still far short of 10 to the 157th. Okay, I've got a ball for every atom in the universe consisting of as many atoms as there are in the universe. I'm going to imagine that crazy exercise happening every second since the universe began. Well, that's about 10 to the 17th seconds, if you do the math. And uh, now I'm still only 10 to the 149th. I've made a ball of atoms equal to all the atoms in the universe. I'm going to do that for each atom in the universe, and I'm going to do that whole silly thing every second for 16 billion years. Is that a big number? I am still short of my 157th. In fact, I'm short by over 100 million to one. You say, now you say, okay, this is pretty silly. What, what, what do you, what, what's your point? Here's my point. I am more convinced that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. Then I am more convinced of that than I am of any other fact in my command. I'm more convinced of his identity than I am my own. Now I have no reason to doubt my identity. I've got a birth certificate. I know my parentage, etc. It's nothing. There's no little gimmick here. And yet, I also realize I know I'm, I could not attach this kind of certainty to any other fact I know of. And uh, so, and incidentally, we've only dealt with 48 of 300. So you can get some idea why some of those estimates aren't that critical. You follow me? If I can make them even looser, you're still, you know, you're, you're out in, in uh, beyond the realm of reasonable doubt. Beyond the realm of reasonable doubt. And incidentally, in going through this little exercise, I've missed the most, the most amazing ones. His detailed genealogy. You can do an analysis of the genealogy of Jesus Christ and be astonished at the precision of issues that are tucked in that genealogy. I won't do it now because we'll do that when we get into uh, Luke and so forth about the virgin birth and all of that, and the daughters of Zelophehad, and, and uh, the blood curse pronounced on Jeconiah, and so on. The specific identification, prediction, of the precise day that the Messiah would present himself as king to Jerusalem, that which we encountered in Daniel chapter 9, take that one prophecy alone, and it is equivalent to everything we've done so far. That one alone. Astonishing precision. And there's a whole bunch of Old Testament and Midrashic prophecies and other ones. What we're dealing here with is what I call the scarlet thread. It starts with God's declaration of war on Satan in the, in the book of Genesis, in which uh, God indicates to Adam and Eve that his plan of redemption will involve the human race. This is not going to be a super angel. It's not going to be some other uh, thing. It's going to involve a man, but it's going to be a perfect man. In fact, it's going, it's going to involve a nation being called. We find that out in Genesis 12, uh, uh, 12 and following. Abraham was called. And so it's not going, come, not going to come from the human race. It's going to come from a specific subset of that, namely the nation Israel. In fact, within that, it's going to come from a particular tribe, the tribe of Jacob. And within that, it's going to be from the family of David. And uh, so this is, this is uh, the, the precision here is astonishing. Now one of the interesting things to discover is as God progressively ex uh, uh, focuses on his plan of redemption, as he reveals the details of his plan throughout the scripture, that gives Satan an opportunity to try to thwart it. You can study your Bible from cover to cover from the point of view of Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. As God reveals another little glimmer of insight, it allows Satan to focus more. 
When God announces that it's going to come from the human race, that allows Satan the, the opportunity to try to corrupt the human race. And that's what led to the hybrids and all that weird stuff going on in Genesis 6 and subsequently. When God calls Abraham in Genesis 12 and following, now Satan can focus on the descendants of Abraham to th try to thwart it. And Satan is, uh, uh, attacks all kinds of, con uh, uh, contrives all kinds of hassles for, for Abraham. The famine in uh, Genesis 50 that finally gets them down to, to Egypt and all the rest. When you get down to, uh, to Egypt, the destruction of the male line by the pharaohs was an attempt. But of course one was secreted out as you all know the story of Moses and so on. Uh, Pharaoh's, even after Pharaoh finally, after the death of the firstborn, all that, he finally lets them go, but then he repents of that and goes after them to try to wipe out the nation. Pharaoh's pursuit. These, each one of these things is Satan's attempt to somehow thwart God's plan. When God tells Abraham that his people will return to Canaan after 400 years, that gave Satan 400 years to lay down a minefield by again using the Nephilim, the Rephaim, the, 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 uh, these corrupt tribes within the land of Canaan. That's why God told Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes. He had a gene pool problem. But then in 2 Samuel 7 when God goes even further and says it's going to come not only out of Abraham and out of Judah and so forth, it's going to be out of the family of David. That allows Satan to focus on the family of David. And we find all kinds of attacks on David's line. Jehoram kills all his brothers, but he misses one. The Arabians slew all, but Hezariah. Athaliah, the queen, uh, kills all, but Joash is, is, is spared. There's always a plot where some servant hides a baby and saves the day, you know. But the, the, the attacks again and again. Hez king Hezekiah is assaulted and so forth in Isaiah 36 and 38. When we get to the book of Esther, the whole plot line of Haman was to wipe out all the Jews in Persia. That was satanic in its root because he's trying to thwart the plan of God. If Haman had succeeded, there would have not been a temple, there would not have been a redeemer. Those things, there are major, very cosmic issues underlying each one of these. When you get to the New Testament, it doesn't change. Joseph finds his betrothed is pregnant. He's fear for, fears for her. But God sends an angel, and you know the story. Herod attempts to wipe him out. When he gets the vision from the Magi, he realizes that there's a, a pretender out there. He slaughters all the children two years and younger. And that was all predicted in the scripture, and he does that. He attempts to do that. When Jesus opens his ministry at Nazareth, they try to throw him off a cliff. He slips away. In the Gospel period, there are two storms at sea, and those storms should not be underestimated. Those ships in those storms were manned by professional seamen who knew those waters. Several of them were in a, a, a business partnership together in fishing. They knew what they were doing. They knew those waters. They were terrified. I'm going to suggest to you that those storms weren't normal storms. And I suggest there's also something else, but when Jesus calms them, it says he rebuked the, st the, the sea. No, I think, that they, I think they were satanic in their origin, personally. And of course, the ultimate strategy was the cross. 